man, Donald Trump, picks up a big Supreme Court victory. Now one justice wonders if SEAL Team 6 could now be unleashed against political rivals. What they're saying inside Trump's orbit, calming fears, but can they? News Nation is told tonight that President Biden's campaign is on the phone right now with top donors. What we're hearing about today's big call. Also this evening, she's on the front cover of Vogue. Again, is the first lady the one shaping the future of the Democratic Party. Plus, Kanye West in Moscow, what is he doing there? And why Pat Tillman's mother is outraged over an award being given to Prince Harry, and she's not alone. Come on in, I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. And hello, good evening. I'm Blake Berman. Welcome to Washington, where tonight the Supreme Court has outraged President Biden's campaign with a ruling on presidential immunity and how Donald Trump acted in the final days of his presidency. What that means in a moment, as the former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and former Trump White House Attorney May Mailman join us live here on the Hill. But first, the current president, his campaign, and can they keep it together? News Nation is told tonight the Biden campaign planned to hold a phone call with top Democratic donors today after Thursday night's disastrous debate performance for the president. We are also told that as the Biden family met at Camp David over the weekend, they urged him to stay in the race with the First Lady Jill Biden and Hunter Biden being the strongest in pushing the president not to get out. The First Lady telling Vogue in an interview released today that they will, quote, Not let those 90 minutes define the four years he's been president. We will continue to fight, she says. Today, the Biden campaign has released a new ad trying to take the president's age and mental fitness head on. Folks, I know I'm not a young man, but I know how to do this job. I know right from wrong. I know how to tell the truth. Now, so far, Democrats who for years criticized Republicans for falling in line directly behind Donald Trump have done the exact same thing with their leader. But it remains to be seen if that might break and if so, when. Joining us here on The Hill tonight, Chris Steyerwald, host of The Hill Sunday, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Ashley Davis, former George W. Bush White House official, Scott Bolden is a News Nation contributor, and Julia Manchester is the national political reporter for The Hill. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in on this Monday on what is going to be a busy week. I I wanted to start off, Chris, by asking you what is before the president and the Democratic Party tonight, but I am just being told that at 745, the president will be speaking on the immunity ruling on the Supreme Court, which then gives us the question, will he take questions from reporters about the other thing? Boy, you can only imagine uh, how fraught that choice is. So the, they've, they've been handed an opportunity to try to reset the discussion uh, and emphasize this topic and get the, the focus back on Donald Trump, which is where they want it. Uh, and you get all that, but you put Biden out there. And, and the first thought that came to my mind was when the report from the Justice Department that described Joe Biden uh, as a well-meaning elderly man with memory problems came out and they said, we're putting him out. We're going to put the president out. Hmm. And he went out and he gave a press, he gave, he gave remarks and then he took questions and it was a disaster. Right. Uh, He mistook the president of India for the president of Egypt. He, it was, it was terrible. So this is a, a high stakes gamble that I think reflects how perilous the situation for the president within right. his own party is so right now. So we just so we we heard from the White House a little while ago that he would be leaving Delaware early at 5 Eastern. Now we know that it's 7:45. He's going to be giving these remarks. What do you expect to hear from him? He, look, I mean, I think he's going to be talking about this presidential immunity case. This is something that obviously Democrats are looking to rally behind, um, you know, to push back on the Supreme Court. Um, we've seen a number of Democrats really uh, amplify Justice Sotomayor's dissent in this. So it definitely gives the administration a chance to take advantage of a new news cycle. But to Chris's point, this is a big gamble. It, yeah. You know, it rem- I so was automatically here- reminded of Robert Hur. Yeah, so here's the, here's the gamble. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, are you going to drop out of the race? Mm-hmm. No questions. You, you don't want him back. taking questions, or you don't think <laughs> he will? I walk back in the room. No, in all but seriousness. Then that's a criticism, he, too. He, right. Don't 
They almost have to put him out there. If this was just a bad night, if he's capable, confident, and competent, right, right then prove it to the American public. If you want to win this race right now, because you were behind before the debate, and now you had a bad debate, and we're rallying around you, now you've got to get out there. Now, there, that may be a good or bad decision, but it's a decision you got to make right, and Joe Biden is the only one that can make it right. you got to put him out there. And if he doesn't do well, now you've got more empirical data that this may be a problem as opposed to just an aberration. So the, the, here's the update from the White House. As I read it, the president will deliver uh, remarks on the Supreme Court's immunity ruling, uh, so on and so forth. It'll be covered by the in-house pool. So that means a small group who is, who is uh, determined, predetermined to cover the president on that day. We don't know, Ashley, you know this from being inside the White House. You don't know if the president's ever going to take questions or not. Mm -hmm. But it is so blatantly apparent that he will be asked it. Yes. Is, is he going to take that head on today? I think he has to, because if he doesn't, then it looks like they're hiding the ball once again. So and you I don't can't really hide think it any longer. Right. No, you, you can't. And, and also, what, what I'm dying to hear, and why, maybe it's in Chris's segment, is when is the tipping point in regards to him having to, to really step aside or not? And is it if the polls that come out that show that not only him is down, or is going down, but also the entire down ballot of Congress yeah. and Davis, Senate. don't ruin my whole okay, so we've got, don't ruin we've got whole Chris I'm coming dying. up. We've got Mick Mulvaney <laughs> coming up on all of this. Uh, but first, division from both President Biden and Donald Trump on a major Supreme Court ruling involving the presidency, which we have been talking about in a 6-3 decision right along ideological lines. The high court ruled today that core presidential powers are immune from criminal prosecution. Now, presidents are given what's known as presumptive immunity for other actions in the high court rule that they are not immune at all from unofficial presidential actions. Now, translate that. It means that Jack Smith's election subversion case against Trump will likely need to be amended and revisited by a lower court, while all future presidents, no matter if their name is Trump, Biden, or anything else, will now have significant cover for their actions while in office. Now, the former president responded by posting, quote, big win for our Constitution and democracy, proud to be an American, while a top Biden campaign official responded today saying, quote, they just handed Donald Trump the keys to a dictatorship. All right, Jesse Weber, come on in. News Nation legal contributor, let me start here. The Supreme Court, did they get this right? Well, I think in the sense that we were hoping for clarity, they added a lot of confusion. Did they get it right? Okay. Look, I think we said that they were going to come down the middle, official acts versus unofficial acts. And where I think the controversy surrounds is that middle ground, right? The idea of if you have core acts that a president takes, like pardoning somebody or um, vetoing a bill or appointing a Supreme Court justice, that's core authority. They shouldn't be prosecuted for that. But this idea that they can be presumptively immune for something that's right. on the outer skirts of responsibility, and as the Supreme Court said, a number of the issues that are in Jack Smith's indictment, the conversations that he had with, um, with the vice president, um, January 6 actions, the fact that now this is going down to a lower court to determine if this is a legal and can be prosecuted, that's why a lot of people are saying this is, we don't know what the outer skirts right. of presidential power are right now. All right, so here's what Sonia Sotomayor raised in her dissenting opinion. She wrote this in part, quote, orders the Navy SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? <laughs> Immune. Orders a military coup to hold on to power? Immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon? Immune. Immune, immune, immune. Is that, is that bluster? I mean, obviously, some of that is bluster, right? You would never right. expect a president of the United States to do that. Well, you certainly hope not. Or is she yeah. on to something? Does she have a point there, right? Basically saying you could take an extreme and then do comma immune. She, it's more of a reality today than it was yesterday. Having said that, okay. I don't think that's necessarily a situation where a president would be allowed to do that. Remember, we talk about the three-part test. You can even say a president has the authority to command the armed forces, right? But the ability to use SEAL Team 6 to murder a political rival on whether it's U.S. soil or foreign soil, you could say right. that goes beyond the limit. But I think she's making a point here, right, is that this is the president was given enormous power today that hopefully is not abused by anyone who sits in that office. Jesse, before, before we let you go, there's three more cases out there, two at the federal level, one yep. at the state level. We, of course, know that uh, July 11th comes the sentencing for the New York case. Give me a number. How many of them happen 
Okay, before so, November 5th. So the federal election interference case is not happening. Georgia, okay. even before today, was a complication. But I, remember, the, the state court judge is going to have to now do this same analysis. There's a chance that will not happen. And then the Mar-a-Lago okay. case, considering it's already been indefinitely postponed, I think there's an interesting question of whether or not he was the president uh, when he stepped down in Florida and had those documents. And now, is that huh. an official act? So I don't think any of these cases happen before the November election, in my opinion. Based Jesse especially Weber, News Nation. News Nation legal contributor. Thank you, Sarah. Talk to you again soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Blake. You got it. All right, come on in. Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House chief of staff, News Nation contributor, and May Melman, former Trump White House attorney and director of the Independent Women's Law Center. Hello to you both. Nice to see both of you, as always. Happy Monday. Uh, May, let's start with you. You wrote that Jack Smith's case is done. Why do you say that? Because there's a 0% chance that you're going to get this in uh, before the election. And that was the point. I mean, the whole case was about interfering with the election. But I also just want to pick up on something that Jesse said, which is that the president has been handed a bunch of power. I completely disagree with that characterization. This was always the case. The Constitution always protected three co-equal branches of government. That includes the executive branch. You cannot have a legislative branch make crimes okay. that tells the president that they can't do their job. This is so, the status quo moving forward as it was before. Obviously, the Sotomayor thing is, is, you could say, an extreme, but let me give you an actual example. Donald Trump in 2020 told the Georgia Secretary of State to go find some 11,000-plus votes. How is that, May, not an official act of office? And then couldn't Joe Biden tell the Secretary of State in Pennsylvania, go find me some 11,000 or whatever votes? I mean, we could play this this game all day long, but how is that not an official act as you see it? couple things. So that's not actually the context of that call, which was there's a ton, ton, ton of uh, fraud here. I only need you to find a small percentage of the fraud. So that was that conversation. But the question about whether something is an official act or not is, is this a conversation that a private citizen is having? Or is this something that the president cares about the quality of our elections? And if this is the president cares about the quality of the elections, then that's immune from prosecution. Is it immune? Uh, you know, should people not consider that as they're voting for, you know, whoever? No. But okay. at the end of the day, presidents can have conversations about whether there's so, fraud in elections. So, Mick, uh, as a former White House chief of staff, I wonder what what you think this means. Zoom out for a second for not only for the White House and not only for Donald Trump, but but that institution as a whole. Yeah, I tell you what I'm not doing if I'm the chief of staff. I'm Jeff Science. I am not going into the Oval Office and saying what a bunch of liberal leading newspapers actually said today, which is, Mr. Biden, I think you should uh, order SEAL Team 6 to kill Donald Trump. By the way, that, that's actually a debate right now with, with a certain print me- media in this country. I'm not saying that because it's absurd. I, and I, the, the language in Justice Sotomayor's dissent is so irresponsible and so over the top. No one really believes what she said, that there's no way that using SEAL Team 6 to kill your political opponent is an official act. All the Supreme Court did here is essentially lay out the rules and they kick it back down to the trial court and say, go take evidence on whether or not these particular things, just as May laid out, is that an official act? Is it, a, is it an act as a private citizen? Let's take some evidence on that. Remember, the Supreme Court doesn't take evidence. They simply use the evidence right. that was given to the trial court. This has got to be the right decision. I can't imagine. I, I'm really disappointed it's not nine to zero. If, if, hmm. if this case was against anybody other than Donald Trump, I think it would have been. But my fear is we see Trump derangement syndrome working its way even into Supreme Court decisions. How did his political fortunes, if at all, change today, Mick, as you see it? Yeah, the political point, and that's probably why everybody's so upset, is not the, not the legal implications of this, because no one really believes what Justice Sotomayor said. It's the political implications. This case won't go before the election. Period. End of story. That's why everybody is so upset. They perceive it as being additional delays so that Donald Trump doesn't face justice before the election in November. That's the political gain here for the Trump camp. May Mailman. Thank you for joining us. Great to see you as always. Nice to have you back here on the Hill on News Nation. Mick Mulvaney, we'll see you in about 15 minutes' time for Hot Mike with Mick. What Mick is hearing and thinking. Uh, he ran a, a White House as a chief of staff, as you might know. So, what does he make of an eye catching report on the current president's work schedule? That is coming up. Plus, the former congressman, Max Rose, joins us on the other side of the break. Hello, Max. And later, Steyerwald is going to break it down. What are the chances of a red 
wave in in November. I guess that's some of what you're getting at. Yeah, that's well, you know, I, I, I'll put it like this. Uh, Democrats have a lot to fear when it comes to an open convention. Uh, so we're going to explore what else they're afraid of, which is not super. Scott, you're not going to want to look speaking at of, speaking, of, speaking of Scott, I can't believe <laughs> no, no, I can't you believe don't want to jump I don't over want you the to side of the bad. table and come after me for yes. not working him in here on the <laughs> Supreme Court stuff. I know. But I there's, a lot to, there's a lot to get to. Live look, by the way, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Don't let the weather fool you. We, we woke up to the 60s here in D.C. today, but it is a picture-perfect sight of the grand prize. Stay with us. You're watching The Hill. here to the Hill on News Nation. So as President Biden and his team mount a campaign against those who want to see him leave the race, one of the key people urging him to stay in is the First Lady Jill Biden, a source tells News Nation. Now, the Biden family gathered at Camp David over the weekend, and we are told they want the president to stay in the race. The First Lady telling Vogue magazine that they will, quote, not let those 90 minutes define the four years he's been president. We will continue to fight. Now, Jill Biden spoke with Vogue as she is Featured on next month's cover out today, which includes the quote, we will decide our future. All right, around the table we go. Jill Biden, no stranger to Vogue, now her second print cover. What do you see, Julia? You know, I think I see someone who's uh, getting out in front of this and uh, defending her husband, defending her family. Uh, we've seen the Biden campaign put on a united, or the Biden family, excuse me, put on a united front, um, gathering at Camp David this uh, past weekend. And I think, um, you know, she's using Vogue and the platform that Vogue, um, you know, has to deliver that. What'd you see there, Scott? Uh, Steely Resolve. Uh, real power behind the throne, but she's been she's earned that place. She's been there with the death of the kids, the death of his wife, and uh, all the other tragedies the Bidens have experienced. She's been that glue, and they've been married for I guess forty plus years. So uh, that's kind of what I see, and she's going to have a real say in what happens next in this uh, campaign and this election. What do, what do you see there? And do you uh, see someone trying to hold on to power, which has been the the sort of... No, uh, I think she protects. I think she is a protector more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I think that their family has been through such tragedy. But but I just want to call out the, this cover, and this has been in, in planning stages for six to eight months at least for her to be on the cover right. of Vogue. It's not like it just happened because of the debate. The timing is, all, is, it's, is it's awful just an here. Interesting and, time. Right. Yes, exactly. But, I mean, you've got to give her the credit. I, if, I, if it was my family, I'd be doing the same thing. Ashley is very right that three months ago when they were talking about this and this photo shoot was taking place, it was a bad idea. But it was a saleable bad idea in which you say to, look, look, it'll help us with the elites who we want to be our donors. This will help us in Hollywood. This is going to help us in Wall Street, people who read Vogue. This is going to be okay. And she shouldn't have done it, but there was a reasonable argument to make it. But now, unfortunately, it lands on the desks of those same people or in the, in the, in the mail slots of these same people hmm. who are furious with the Bidens right now for all that has gone wrong. And it becomes uh, a not just a bad idea, but a terrible idea. Don't do it. Don't right. do things like that. Joining us now, the former New York congressman, a Democrat, friend of the show, Max Rose. Max, come on in. Nice to have you. Great to see you and speak with you as always, buddy. Um, are you among those Democrats, as, as Chris just outlined, furious with the Bidens? Where are you? No, I'm not furious. Um, it was Frustrated? obviously... I, I'll tell you who I'm frustrated with, because I'm, I'm not going to go with this old line, it was a bad night. Uh, I mean, I think that's a little, a little bit of a weird response. I'm frustrated with the campaign staff, um, because I think that, first of all, the prep for this debate was pretty god-awful. I mean, you look at the fact that they went for seven days, as reported by the Washington Post, at least 18 White House staff took part in this prep. I mean, they were treating this thing like it was SAT prep or a McKinsey interview, when in reality, what you're dealing with on the part of Donald Trump is, yes, a simpleton, yes, a sociopath, but also a showman who basically just went out there, no matter what the question was, look at the child care question, for instance, he just turned around and said, you're the worst president in the history of the United States, next question. Right. And it was a fantastic opportunity for Joe Biden to actually do what he's uniquely suited to do, which is just talk straight talk and <clears throat> really engage in a back and forth. Were, that was the success of his State fear, of the were Union. Your, were your worst fears realized, though? 
No, no, no. I mean, uh, I'm like 5'5". Five, five. You know, I've got worse fears associated with being the short kid. I've got worse fears associated with being like the short so me, kid so in me, high school. So let man. me ask you. Like, like, let, let, let's, let, let, let's, but but he, here's, here's, the, here's the challenge, right? Yeah. It, it, there was plenty of people out there who now feel as if, okay, they have visual evidence that the president isn't suited for yeah. the job. And, and so, so you... it is the responsibility of the campaign to either drop out, stop this thing, or get out there and quell those worries. So, and, I, and that's my sincere hope that they start to do those so things. L- let me ask you this. What is the breaking point, Max, uh, to that point? Because there's a new poll out in the state of New Hampshire. It hasn't gone red since 2020. Donald Trump almost flipped it in 2016 uh, by like half a point sure. or so. And it, it shows Trump up two. And that's from St. Anselm College, which is, which is reputable, as you know. And so if we're starting to see that in New Hampshire. I wonder, Max, if, if we're going to see it elsewhere and yeah. when and if there's a breaking point. No, look, look it, it, you know, it's, it's funny. From the, from the vantage point of, I think, the Biden culture and modern Democratic Party culture, they're not really going to listen to the noise in the 48 hours after this debate. But it, it's going to be very interesting to see what the reaction is when polls come out in about two, three, four days because it's not a quick turnaround, a poll, right? So they went out into the field the day after the debate. There's going to be a 24, 48 hours of analysis after right. a three-day poll. And it, you'll see what the actual impact of this was. Now, ironically, the president also had his best hour of fundraising in the hour after the debate. So this is not that simple. Donald mm-hmm. Trump also revealed himself to be a total nut job. During that debate, if anyone did, yeah, but you know, you know what, so you you know what people saw, Max. And well, that's, no, that's, it, that's, and that's that's not that's not my point. I'm just trying to say in response to okay. that that this is more complicated than what we saw, which was obviously the president at times not being able to finish a sentence. I'm not denying what happened, but I'm also not denying the fact that Donald Trump showed himself to be a maniac, and people have a visceral response to that too. All right, we got to leave it there. Max Rose, former Democratic congressman, coming to the studio on a hot day in Manhattan in a T-shirt. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> you, didn't give me, you didn't give me much notice, man. I mean, I told I'm sorry. You, well, and you, and you came when I texted, so we appreciate it. Thank you, Max. What a setup. See you soon. Not a setup at all. All right. Still much more ahead here on The Hill. Speaking of setups, hot mic with Mick, the former congressman, budget director, White House chief of staff, tells us what he's hearing, what he's thinking. Mick, I want to know what Republicans are telling you, what you're hearing from them. Yeah, there's actually some interesting parallels to something they've been through themselves, and I'll tell you about it uh, on the other side. All right. Hot Mike with Mick. You're watching The Hill. All right. Welcome back to The Hill on News Nation. President Biden's debate now giving former President Trump and congressional Republicans uh, uh, their campaign's ammunition against Democrats. Senate Republican candidate, for example, in Pennsylvania, Dave McCormick, posting on X about his opponents, saying, quote, Bob Casey lied to Pennsylvanians for years about his friend, Joe Biden's ability to serve as president. Casey was proud to campaign with Biden. Now he's gone off the grid. You can't just trust Bob Casey. Time now for Hot Mike with Mick, the former congressman, budget director, White House chief of staff, tells us what he's hearing, what he's thinking. All right, Mulvaney, is that what we're going to get from Republicans now yeah. uh, after Thursday night's debate? Yeah, Blake, this has been just a fascinating couple of conversations I had with some Republican friends over the weekend. One of them described it in a way that just absolutely struck home for me, which is it's sort of their access Hollywood moment on the Democrat hmm. side. That's what I was thinking. It's clearly yeah. not the exact same thing, right? It's not exactly the same, but yeah. put yourself in a Democrat candidate's shoes right now. You have to go out today and over the weekend and defend what you saw. You have to, you're going to have questions. Is this person fit for office? Are you going to call for somebody else to, to, to run instead? What are you doing to help fix the problem? It's, it's a place that's got Democrats looking for places to hide, just like the Access Hollywood tape for, did for, for, for with, uh, with Republicans in 2016. The difference mm-hmm. is, and it's an important difference, is that remember the Access Hollywood tape took place in the September, October. In fact, I think I had a, yeah, right in fact, I know I had a debate that night that the tape came out, so we had very little time to react. Democrats will have more time, but believe me, they're looking for a way to move on to the next topic as quickly as they possibly can. 
But, that, but this is what continues for if Biden does have to step down ultimately, because it's not just McCormick. McCormick's been having a little bit of trouble getting traction in Pennsylvania. He's still significantly down and in, into the polls. Casey's a well is well liked in Pennsylvania, uh, but this is something that gives him new content to right. talk about. And every single how many you know there are six at least Senate races that are potentially up for grabs. I mean, I would say three. Really? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 But I mean, everyone's going to be do, doing yeah. it. And, and that's why that's why I wanted to highlight it, highlight this, Julia, because right. I, I wonder, as Mick points out, if this is what we are going to see down ballot, which is Republicans saying, "You knew, yep. you knew, Democrats, and and you know, now, now time to pay for it. You're, their view." Is- you're already seeing it down ballot. So David McCormick, just one piece of that. The um, Senate Republican campaign arm has an entire video compilation with Ruben Gallego, Bob Casey, John Tester, Alyssa Slodkin, all of these Democratic Repu- uh, Democratic incumbents and challenge candidates, essentially saying, "Oh." We're fine with his performance, and it kind of puts them in a position now. It's like, well, have you been talking to the president that much, right. or um, are you being just truth, uh, not truthful? Further down the ballot, you're seeing House Democrats do the same thing. You're even seeing Republicans at the state level do this. Um, the question I have, though, is how big of an impact it has in these races where you see Bob Casey pulling ahead of Joe Biden and trying to run a state, um, you know, somewhat localized race. It's interesting. There was a new Harvard Harris poll that was out earlier today, and it showed the uh, basically the, the the race between Trump and Biden right. unchanged from the debate. They started polling a day after. Now, in terms of what voters thought about Biden, that got worse for him. Right. But the between the two of them, not well. But you know, Blake, I uh, I don't think uh, Mick said we're running for a place to hide as Democrats. I think we're running for a solution. We need a solution and a solution fast. And then secondly, okay, if Biden steps down, who's up next and how complicated is that? And can that get done in five months? And I'll tell you, with the GOP, I, I think uh, they want nothing less than for Biden to stay in the race. Yeah, I think- Because someone that's younger, more articulate, and can take Donald Trump on in a debate per se, um, um, they ought to be more worried about that, which is ironically different from the Democrats a year ago, as I've said before, where we wanted the, to run, we wanted Donald Trump to stay in the I'll give you the last I word. I would then love to run against Mulvane. Kamala Harris. And would you really? <laughs> How about Gavin Newsom? And, and I would love to run against okay. And that's part of the conversation. Other than the All San right. Francisco problem. Mick, by the way, Axios <laughs> is now reporting that President Biden's close aides, led by his wife Jill, carefully shielded the president from White House staffers from almost the very start of his presidency. The president's access has reportedly been so limited, according to Axios, that his debate behavior shocked many current and former White House officials. All right, so you were a White House chief of staff for give or take a year and a half. I wonder what you make of it, Mick, when you saw that story and that headline and the details around it. Yeah, and there's another story out by Axios today that also has a, a, a number, another member of the senior team saying that, you know, Biden is outperforming all of them. He's, he's, he's working 24 hours a day. He's putting even the younger people to, to shame, et cetera. That, exactly. And he gets that kind of response. Look, the president of the United States is probably the most insulated and isolated role, job in the entire world. And the president absolutely has to have people in his inner circle that he can trust to tell him what is going on in the outside world, because the president mm. simply doesn't have that ability because of the, the, the nature of the job. And if the people most interior to the president, the, the senior most advisors are lying to him, or at least not letting him hear the truth, you can get some really, really, really bad results. The debate is one. You can have a conversation about whether or not January 6th is another. Go back through history. You could do the Bay of Pigs. You can do a Grand Contra. You can do a bunch of different things. When the White House is not functioning properly, things can break down. Thankfully, this is not a policy thing. This was just a debate. And watch. I'm going to make Scott Boland smile before you all kick me off here tonight. Keep in mind, the Democrats are now having the exact same conversations the Republicans had about Donald Trump after Access Hollywood. But Donald Trump still won in 2016. So there's still right. light at the end of that tunnel for, for the Democrats. <laughs> but they have to fix the White House. If they do not fix the way the White House works, this is not going to be the last time you see a major, major mistake. But Mick, real quick, what about the, the chief of staff, the senior advisors and those folks around the president who are with him daily or close to daily and the frustration that we are hearing about those folks that they didn't say anything or that they didn't sit him down and say, Mr. President, 
a, a second term might not be the best idea. A second run might not be the best idea. Yeah, every White House is different. Okay, the, the, the power dynamics in every single White House is different. Talk to chiefs of staff, they'll tell you that. But there's always going to be a power dynamic. Go back to what happened during the Reagan administration. Who was the real power behind the throne? It was Nancy Reagan. Okay? Uh, and the chief of staff oftentimes, in fact, when the chief of staff went up against Nancy Reagan, he ended up losing his job. Um, so my question about this White House is not, is it, is it, is it Jeff Zients, is he really running the, the place, or is it Jill Biden? I think that's a fair conversation okay. to have, because the, the chief can't do it without the team behind him. And if the first lady is not there, it can be very difficult to get that. Hot mic with Mick. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Thanks, y'all. You got it. All right. Still to come here on the Hill. Steyerwalt breaks it down. Um, we're going to be looking at, obviously, we're waiting for a lot of pooling to come in. But mm -hmm. where things were up until this moment mm -hmm. and why that could really be an alarm for, mm -hmm. for Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. keep it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back in a few. <laughs> I get that the American brand has been damaged, but where in the world is better right now? This was politically motivated. I think it's a real problem for Democrats, for the country. What's wrong with debating policy? On Balance, the Ferris show on television, Heat Night 7 Eastern on News Nation. Reportedly issued a stark warning to the Biden campaign. Michigan is no longer winnable. According to a new report, the Michigan governor spoke to Biden's campaign chair <laughs> on Friday in an effort to distance herself from the efforts to force Biden out of the race. Now, the claim came about uh, her Michigan warning. She said it came from the camp of a potential rival and Whitmer denied it on X. OK, Juliet, so she, this is... This shows the intrigue of 2028. Yes. Is why we are talking about this. Because, right? You think so? Hmm? You go. Okay. <laughs> you asked her. Here, I want to Why hear. I find I it interesting hear. is I because like it. it's, it's sort of the 2028 jockeying already yeah. right now in 2024 because maybe they see it a, a crease over. I think that's a part of it. Um, I think there's a number of factors at play. But from the 2028 angle, I think what this shows is that you have the Gretchen Whitmers, the Josh Shapiros, the Wes Moores, the Andy Bashirs, all of these, Kamala Harris, the vice right. president, she would be first in line, obviously. All of these people are looking at this and saying, right now we're sort of hedging our bets. We're going to go with Biden. They don't want to burn any bridges. They don't want to do something that would seem be, be seen as too rash going into the convention. Right. They're rallying behind Biden. You know, whether that holds up until August, we'll see. But I think that's what you're seeing here. Uh, she just wants to make sure everybody knows <laughs> that the huge demands for her to <laughs> take too. over the that Democratic. Too. Now, she doesn't want it. She's telling people, right. I know you want me. You want to draft me. But right. please know I love Joe Biden too much right. for this massive. But he's also going to lose Michigan. <laughs> yeah, but he's also going to lose Michigan. Well, what she's what she saying is not now. Right. I don't she's want any part of it. You think not Michigan's now. Done? I don't think Michigan's done. I think the next two to four weeks is going to tell us a lot about whether Biden's in or out and what the polling shows. And then we can look at the swing states. All right. Well, Whitmer's reported uh, Michigan prediction. Obviously a concern for Democrats since that state is critical. The president basically needs to win that state. But it's uh, not just for the presidential election, but there's also a key Senate race there. One reason a lot of House Democrats have privately been critical of the president's debate performance is because of fear he could hurt the party's congressional chances. But despite President Biden's poor performance in the debate, were there already warning signs for Democrats? Steyerwaltz, they rolled your graph. Wait, real question. Right, Is one bring of bring your down. three Senate races <laughs> Michigan, include Michigan or not? Because I think Michigan we can win. <clears throat> okay, bring it out. Don't, <laughs> don't interfere. I haven't even pulled out. <laughs> Unlike wish I got it. I got it. I got excited when I heard draft Gretch because I thought it was Sherry Gretch. And <laughs> oh, I guess Gretch. that would, I would definitely vote for her for president. Um, and I may. Uh, okay. So it is reasonable for Democrats to be worried about a contested convention, for sure. And the headlines say it, Biden debate performance is a nightmare, sure, but they're uh, scared of a contested convention. They fear replacement scenarios as much as keeping Biden. It will be bad, it will be bad, it will be bad. Sure, it will be bad if they do it. If they have to switch horses in midstream, it would be bad. But you know what else would be bad? This. Here is the general election polling average going into these, uh, as from our partners at Decision Desk HQ, going into the debate. This is before the debate. What do you see there is Joe Biden losing the national popular vote. If Joe Biden loses the national popular vote by this many points, by six tenths of a point, 
he would lose in the Electoral College by 315, 320. It would be the worst loss for a Democrat in the Electoral College since George H.W. Bush in 1988. There's uh, hard to overstate because Democrats need to, and we say this all the time, but I remind you again, you can look at the state polls, hang out with the state polls, sure, but you don't really need to. Look at the national polls. Democrats have to win nationally by more than three points because the swing states are more Republican than the nation as a whole. Hillary Clinton won the national popular vote by more than two points, and she lost in the Electoral College. Joe Biden won the national popular vote by four and a half points, and he had a squeaker. So just remember that a tie is a loss nationally for Democrats. Look at the swing state margins. Bring that back. I want to see that again. I want America to see again. Here are what the states look like going, again, this is going into the debate. This is before the debate. And this is Biden up in only one of the seven swing states. And there it's by a tenth of a point. Again, before, this is before. So if you're a Democrat, you ask yourself, how much did the debate hurt? And as we were talking about before, we won't know. We won't know this week. It'll really be next week because the 4th of July holiday screws up polling. So it'll really be next week before we see how it hits. But we alluded to earlier that New Hampshire poll ain't junk, and he's down in New Hampshire. So this is what it adds up to. If Biden's only down another, let's say, point and a half, here's what it adds up to. Look at these numbers. This is 42.5 to 46.1. Balance of power. All Republican wins in the Congress and, as we know, a conservative-leaning judiciary. As Democrats think about the dangers of an open convention, of a contested convention, of Kamala Harris, this is what they're thinking about on the other side, which is a wipeout of generational proportions potentially for Democrats, given this map, these conditions, and what's going on. Steyerwalt breaks it down. So, um, real quick, you can answer her question. Well, all right, what's the question? Do you think we can win Michigan Senate right We now? meaning you're talking about Republicans. Yes. I think you people could win in I think you people could win in, in Michigan. I think it's possible you could win in a lot of places. But here's what we know. Democrats are poised to only be able to keep the Senate if they win the presidency because they need Kamala Harris as the tiebreaker because Democrats have ceded West Virginia. Montana's dangling, Ohio's dangling. We don't know what's gonna happen with Carrie Lake and all that madness out in Arizona. We don't know what's going to go on in other places, but one more state flipping gives the Senate to Democrats. And yes, you're right that in the event that Biden stays in the race and he can't repair the damage and get it back at least to a tie, other states start to come into play. All right. Still to come here from the Hill on News Nation. What is Kanye supposedly doing in Moscow? Are there any good reasons for that? And why the mother of the late Pat Tillman has some questions about Prince Harry. We'll get into that. Plus, the 745 uh, statement from President Biden, what we expect to hear out of the president. And in just moments, on On Balance, uh, Lee, uh, on Balance is talking to Joe Lee. He is the coach of the sprint phenom Quincy Wilson from just down the road from us here in Maryland. The 16-year-old heading to the Olympics. Stay with us. We're back in a few. to the Hill on News Nation. So the rapper and producer Kanye West, legally known as Yee, making news for going east. Russia state media is claiming uh, that West touched down in Moscow on Sunday. The team for his fashion brand Yeezy says he is there to meet the head of design. But if this is all true, it makes West the first major American celebrity to visit Moscow since the start of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Meantime, the annual Pat Tillman Award for service is given every year by ESPN to a, quote, person with a strong connection to sports who has served others in a way that echoes the legacy of the former NFL player, end quote. Now, it's been given to Purple Heart recipients, Iraq War veterans, Paralympic gold medalists, but this year's recipient is receiving a little bit of backlash. Tillman's mother is said to be shocked by Prince Harry getting the award for his help in starting the Invictus Games. That is an international sports competition for wounded veterans. 
She is quoted as saying, uh, quote, there are recipients that are far more fitting, including some who, quote, do not have the money, resources, connections, or privilege <clears throat> that Prince Harry has. That from the mother of Pat Tillman. All right. As we close out the hill here on News Nation, I want to give you a live look at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as President Biden. Let, let's end where we started, which was this breaking news that the president in about uh, 48 minutes time is going to go before the cameras to address the Supreme Court immunity ruling. Now, this was, of course, the, the ruling that came out of the high court today involving what presidents can and cannot do while they are in office. But it is also the first time, Julia, that we will see and hear from President Biden since Thursday night's debate. We do not know if he will take questions. Yeah, so we were talking about this during the break and sort of throughout the show. It's an opportunity, it's also a risk. Um, if he takes questions, if he's you know has a strong performance, if he's able to be quick on his feet, great. But if he has a slip up like he had in the press conference following the Robert Hur report, right. that's going to be an issue and make this 10 times worse. Got no choice, he's gotta go, you gotta go. And uh, either he, he wins or loses on each of these subsequent appearances and you gotta let him freestyle. And see what happens. If you if you have confidence in him, then you do that. If you don't, then you don't do that. And he, and he gets out of the race, I guess. Ashley? Yeah, no, I, you think, even after something like this, if it's really that bad? Well, I think you got to find out. If yeah. it's just one bad night, then prove to us, prove to the American voter that it was one bad night. And the question is if he can do that repeatedly. Yes. Right. Absolutely. No, I think he needs to do it. I mean, as we talked about at the beginning, mm -hmm. I think he absolutely needs to do it. But I think it's a huge risk, and... To be clear, we don't know if he's going to take questions, right? We do know or presume that he will be on prompter to talk about this one thing, but... What's he going to do? Shuffle away and like not a take any dog questions. with right. a broken yeah. leg yeah. away yeah. From, the, from the press that's screaming questions at him? Right. Sure. Joe Biden's, that's even worse. Joe Biden's career has been marked by audacious, sometimes reckless ambition mm -hmm. and he, taking huge chances over and over again. And we see him. He did it with moving up the time of the debate. Now he's doing this. Joe Biden pushes his luck, and we'll see whether it pays off for him but he's tonight. a comeback kid, though, politically. Yeah, he always has been. There is one thing we didn't talk about tonight is that they're talking about moving up his vote in regards to becoming the official the candidate. They're doing, it. they're doing it because of Ohio. They no, no, say no, it's but because there's of Ohio. A, no, there's something new that's going to be in two weeks that it's a virtual conversation. Yeah, no, that's I, it. That, 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 that was, okay. That, All, right. Yeah. All right, so here's the stage as we leave you on the Hill as it is about to be 7 o'clock Eastern. We're going to hear from the president in 45 minutes' time.